So I made a video earlier talking about testing purchasing power parity in R. And one of the series I'd used was the European Union or the Eurozone inflation rate. And that series, the underlying CPI, had some seasonality issues. And I'd kind of talked about some alternative ways of deseasonalizing data or, or making inflation rates. So I'm going to show you here how to do that in R using this STL package, which can, which can decompose a series into the seasonality and trend components. So I'm going to use the same CSV file with the same four data series, but I'm only going to use one of them. And I am going to use the package STL, which I believe is a base package. So we're going to deseasonalize the series. Now, today my uh, jump drive is on I, so I changed the working directory to I, but I left it in F for you. Um, and I'm going to read the same PPP data. All right, so we're going to load that, set the working directory, and read it. And you can see up here it's got the four variables, I think one of which is the date, and then 238 observations, which is monthly. When I check the head, always look to see what you have. I've got the date, U.S. CPI, the original FRED data name for the CPI in the Eurozone, and then the U.S. dollar per euro exchange rate. I, I'm going to just change the name of column three. And so in the other video, I just did all four, even though I only needed to change one. What you do here is you change the column name as data, and then in the brackets, there's no comma or anything. It's just the third unit in there because it's a list, right? You don't need a comma if it's just a list. And then I change that to CPI or EU CPI. So then you do that. And then you can see here that I've actually renamed it. So that's one way to rename just one at a time. So I'm only going to leave EU CPI. I'm going to remove the date. I'm actually going to remove everything else. And so I'm just going to have what is there, which is just simply column three. When I do that, now it's simply one thing of data. I believe I lost the name as I went. So later on, I'm going to put it back on. But I just leave column three, and now my data is simply the EU CPI. So now we have to make a time series. So I'm going to use this time series command, TS, which data is my series. That's what I made. That's what I tend to name my data sets. It's going to start at 1999-1, and it's month one. And you have to tell it, again, that it's one by saying there's 12 units per year. So it's monthly. All right, so I'm going to make that, and it's going to plot for me using just the basic thing. And here you can kind of see, especially over here, that this is the seasonality, the, the annual ups and downs. And that's what we're going to deal with here. So we're going to decompose using loss smoothing. Um, it, when you make the final file, the final object, it's not just more than the time series. It's going to make multiple time series for the different components, but it has more to it than that. So I'm going to run this. So I'm going to make TS data 1 so I don't erase my original one. I'm going to run the STL command, and it's going to put in TS data. And then you have to choose a window length. And can read more about it in the documentation for the package. It has to be, I believe, odd and minimum of seven. I'm keeping it at the minimum uh, because I, it just looks like it sort of appears later. I tested it. It's pretty. The reason why it looks so big here is because the level is higher, so but proportionally it's about the same. But I'm kind of leaving the basic stuff. There's actually a lot more you could put in here, and I'm not. So I'm deliberately leaving it simple for today. But you might want to play around with it and look at more. So I'm gonna make TS data one. And then if you look at it, um, well, first I'll do that. And then I'll show you the result. All right, remember, you have to call it again. There's, if you just put that in, it's got a whole bunch of stuff to it. All right, um, but uh, there's actually, if you type in TS data one, then here, there's the time series, which we're going to call, but there's also other stuff here, weights, etc. So we're simply going to, you have to use the dollar sign to separate exactly what you want. So I, I want to show you the head of that. And then it's breaking it down into the seasonal, trend, and then the remainder. Right. So column one is the seasonal component. Trend is, is the overlying, so it's more of a straight line. And then the remainder could be cycle and error. Right. So let's plot that. It's going to plot all three, as well as the original data. You can see here's what we started with. Seasonal component does appear to be growing, but it's proportional to the high CPI as CPI rises. Trend, this is smoother and more long run. And then this is the remainder. And you can almost extract some sort of, sort of a cycle like you could with a business cycle. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, uh, basically combine the original data series, the non-deseasonalized series, with the deseasonalized series. So I'm going to say EU CPI DS, which is for the, the seasonality. Um, and then. Uh, I could put SA or something. I usually put DS for some reason. It was deseasonalized. Um, TS data, right? And then I'm going to, to make this, I'm going to actually subtract the seasonality out. And so I'm going to take the original data and I'm going to subtract the first column of the time series. And remember, the data here is not part of that. The column one is actually the seasonal part. So I'm going to do that. All right. And then when I do that, it looks pretty smooth. 
and it's good enough for here. And again, you might want to play around with the windows to make it even smoother. Um, I got to mention one alternative that people use is the Census X12 method, which is common, but not too easy to use in R, but other software, eViews, and some other things you do with Census X12. All right. So I'm going to make this TS data, right, which is going to come uh, column bind the original TS data, and then it's going to add on my new CPI, the deseasonalized, and then just to keep it, um, if you if you do the head, you'll see here that it's lost the name. So I'm just going to redo the name here. And then you can see that I put the original name back on. Right? So sometimes your stuff disappears, and that's why I always say check the head. Um, it's a lot easier just to fix it as you go, or just as long as you know there's a problem. Right? So you're going to plot them together. So first I'm going to plot TS data. It's going to make two separate graphs here. And you can see that they cover the same span, and this is much smoother. The deseasonalized is much smoother. But now I'm going to plot them together. So this is my command. I'm going to plot in TS data, column 1, no X label. Leave it blank, because I don't like to see time, because that's kind of redundant. Um, and because it's going to be together, we don't need that. So no X label and no Y label. I'm going to make a line with the four, co color name of dark gray, and the main is just going to be EU CPI. And, and how did I choose these parameters? I actually tested it. I looked at it. If it looked too thin, I made it thicker. So I've chosen that based on trial and error. Then I'm going to call and superimpose with new equals true. Then I'm going to plot column two, same thing. Uh, no column names, a little bit thinner, but the color is going to be black, and the line type is two. It's going to be a little dashed. And then finally, I'm going to add a legend. Legend is going to be located at the bottom right. There's a number of choices for that. LTY line type is a combination of the 1 and the 2 here. Now, I didn't put LTY equals 1 up here. It's assumed default is 1, so it's 1 and then 2 from the bottom. Line width, 4 and then 2. Colors, dark gray and black, so it's exactly parallel to the 2. And the legend is the names, not adjusted and seasonally adjusted. All right, so if I do this, it will make one nice graph here. And you can see here that the straight black line is much smoother and the seasonality moves up and down from it. All right, so now I'm going to make month-on-month uh, -month inflation rate. I'm going to do it two different, actually, I'm going to make three series. One is going to be once per month, right, January over December, and then December over November. And remember, sometimes students will say, like, they make one a year, like, they're going to make a 1980 inflation rate compared to 1979, or they're going to make 2009 compared to 2008. You actually have a new value every month. It's a continuous series. So you move from February to March, you're going to update it, right? So, so you go February to last February, and then for March, you're going to make March compared to last March. So even though there's a big gap, you don't eliminate observations. It has almost as many observations as you have when you started. For 12 months, you lose the first data points, right? So if you start in 1999, your first available data will be in 2000. So you're going to lose 12 months, right? But you're not, with, once you start, it's, it's every month has its own value. So here's what I go. EU inflation 1 is going to be, I'm going to start here. It's 12. It's TS data column two. The DC um, that is my uh, DC lines data, right? And that is over the lag, right? We did lags before, but here the lag. This is the same series. It's still column two, all right? And but the lag is only one. And remember to go back in time. Make sure you have the minus sign, right? And notice that that's in parentheses, right? And then the next thing, I'm, I'm actually might have an extra set here, but just to be sure, I'm not going to delete it. Um, but for here, right, remember you take the ratio, and, and remember, something that's 20% bigger would be 1.2. For example, if you if you subtract the 1, then you would have 0.2, right? And then to turn 0.2 into a percentage, you would have to, to be times 100 to say 20%. So you'd be normally 100 here, but because this is just 1 12th of the year's inflation, you can also multiply by 1,200 so that you're going to make it as if it was for the whole year. You're going to annualize it. So the 100 part is just simply to turn a decimal into a percentage, but the 12 part is to take one month and turn it into like a 12-month value. Right? So go out with the parentheses here. All right. Um, and so then this this is the minus 1. So there's two minus 1s here. This minus 1 is just the lag of 1, and then this one is simply in the part of the percentage formula. All right? So I'm going to make EU1, or EU inflation run. And it works. I'm also going to make year on year, which we've done before, which is over, it's almost the same, but it's a 12-month lag. Nothing else changes. Don't change the underlying data. And of course, you don't have to change it because it's a whole year. It's already annual, so just leave it at 100. I'm going to do that. And as an alternative, I'm going to make if so the 12 is just simply for the 12 months. But the B part is kind of like my alternative. What I'm doing here is I am not using the deseasonalized data. I'm using the original non-deseasonalized data. So it's the same formula, but it's column one, which is just the non-deseasonalized. Because you think what this because this annualized series ignores seasons anyway, because you're always comparing February to February, as opposed to uh, two months with different parts of the year. 
you think that they would um, be the same, and they pretty much are, right? So it kind of doesn't matter which one you use. And right? so just to make sure I do that. Um, and so now I've got three series here. So, and I'm going to put them all in one data frame. So I've got, I'm going to call it INF for inflation. I'm going to column bind inflation one for the one month, inflation 12 for the 12 month, and 12B for my alternative. And right? so the three together, I'm going to run it. And then I'm going to look at the head and I'm going to look at the tail. I right? always make sure, especially because you have uh, different length series. Okay, so inflation one is a longer series because it only loses one month per year, right? If you go February to January, you lose January. You have, that will have to be blank because your first data series has, has nothing to subtract, right? But that loses one observation, but your 12 month will lose more. Right? So that's why it's not available up here. At the, they catch up at the end, right? At the end, they're all, they're all here, so that means they line up the way you want them to. Right? So it's going to look a little shorter at the beginning for one of them. Right? You can see here, this, they're not the same but the one month is going to be much more volatile. It's got ups and downs, right? Here, these are almost the same, right? They're not quite identical, but they're close, right? And if we look at the averages, they should all average out over the course of the year, and they're roughly the same average. So, so the, the one month value is going to have more swings, but the ups and downs cancel each other out. And then the two alternatives here are pretty much identical. They're a little bit at this decimal place, but it's almost the same. Right? So now I'm going to plot them together. And I'm only going to talk about these first two of them. I'm not going to use this alternative. So I'm going to plot the first column, no labels, width of two, color dark gray, and I'm going to call it E inflation. And then I set the limits of the y axis. And that's just because I looked at the maximum and minimum. You might have to look at it or, or test it, <coughs> but I'm going to make it based on what I see. And I'm going to call a new one and superimpose. And then I'm going to plot the second column, right? In 12 month, same thing, no labels. I'm going to change a little bit of the. the uh, point size, but I'm going to make this black instead of dark gray. A straight line and the same thing. You want the same limits. That's one reason why you choose these because if you don't put them in, it's going to choose its own. And it's, it, this might go up to 100 and this might go to 80. And it's going to plot and it's actually going to, the numbers will be different here, but it's going to plot everything right in the middle and it's going to not line up properly. Right? And remember, when you're looking at R code, this is just my choice. This is my eyeballs. Don't like, you know, religiously say, like, it's got to be line with one, right? It never has to be. It's based on what I think looks good, which might not be what you looks good. It's not something to memorize, but there's certain concepts behind it. I don't want my data to not overlap properly. I, I want the, the chart to look good, but that's about it. All right, so I'm going to put this on the bottom left because here's the sign here, All right? And so forth. Um, it's going to look kind of the same, but I, the concepts are the same, right? The two and the one for the width, right? The one and the one, they're both lines, I believe. Um, and then the colors are dark gray and black, so these are, these directly correspond to the two things. And then I'm going to call them monthly annualized and annual, right? So when I do that, I'm going to plot them here. It's going to be this. And I, I deliberately one reason why I put this so low, so I had room for this box. You can see that this line here runs through. It's kind of thin, but but the this runs through like that. And if I don't like that, if I think it's too thin, right? I could simply change the uh, width. The, the width of the annualized one. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to make it a little thicker and show you again. And that's one reason why we use R, right? One little change, one letter, just press click, click run, and all of a sudden it's different. If you use other software, you have to use a whole bunch of drop-down menus and stuff like that. So I'm going to leave it for now, but you can play around with it. All right. And so my, my legend's at the bottom left, and it exactly matches, and it looks like that. And you, there's more you can do to take off the box and stuff, but I, I left it for today. All right. And finally, I always end with making high-res JPEG files pretty much the same. I give it a file name in quotes. This to be 5 by 3 And notice that it's kind of like the square, right? So it's a 3 by 5 inch graph, which would look good in a work, Word document. 300 DPI resolution, and everything kind of matches. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to run, and it won't appear, right? And if you want to kill all your graphs, by the way, you can just do this. The device off gets rid of your graphs. All right, so then I'm going to do the second one, which, which we just did. It's about the same size. Everything is going to repeat it. And um, here you go. If you run it, again, nothing's there. But if you go to your drive, I'm going to go to my iDrive, and I've got my graphics up here. All right, so I'm going to preview it. And it will open at some point. And here we go. So this is where you can clearly see the inflation rates run through. Notice that the annual annualized, the, excuse me, the 12 month annual series, which goes from this February to last February and cuts out all those months, you lose 
11 more observations here. So you can see that it's shorter, but it all lines up at the end. One thing to watch out for is if you line it up wrong, you might have it start early and end early. That's actually the wrong years, right? They have to end at the same time, right? So this is my EU inflation rate. And then uh, what I did here with the EU CPI, right? So what, what would I do to have to fix it? I would have to actually change the Y limit, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So when I've got the EU CPI, right, what, what I have Y limit 60 to 110, and here is 60 to 110, all right? So if I put an error or if I take it off, it's gone. So again, make a mistake in other software, just redo it, all right? So I'm going to run it, and it's actually going to reprint in here, and now it's fine. All right, so that's the example of what happens if you uh, fail to line it up properly. Okay, so you can fix it um, with one click, one character, just click run, and all of a sudden everything updates. And I know a lot of people will do even more with Markdown and make stuff show up like automatically in a Word document. I'm sort of old school in that I make images and pull them into Word. Um, do it however you like it, but again, I kind of show the problems as I go. But not lining up is one of them. So we have the nice JPEGs that you could use for another software. So. Um, and they show up in the same drive, I mean, in this case my iDrive, shows up in the same drive that you set as your working directory. And I'm putting everything in my root folder just to not have a long name, but you probably want to have a, a subfolder. Right? So that's what we did. I took a, kind of a data set that we'd already used and a problem that I had sort of pointed out, and I'd sort of mentioned that there's alternative ways to, to talk about inflation based on seasonality, and what we did was we took that series, we looked at it, we deseasonalized it, we kept the seasonal component, took it out, and then we compared deseasonalized and non deseasonalized data. And then finally, we took a 12 month inflation rate and a, a one month inflation rate and compared them side by side and plotted them. And then, using uh, some statistical tests, we looked at averages, but we also plotted it. We were able to kind of make some nice graphs that uh, showed the, the presence of seasonality as well as two measures or two methods of deseasonalizing data. Or Two, and two measures of uh, making an inflation rate. So hopefully that'll help, and hopefully you'll be able to use R to eliminate seasonality when you, when you encounter it in your own work.